Um, I don't know what your definition of a workshop is, but mine is to um, give you a little bit of information um, and then to get you guys to do the work. I think it's what workshop means, isn't it? Um, but to do the thinking process. Uh, as I sat there this morning, um, listening to the four different um, presentations, um, my immediate thought, as often is, and I've been doing this for 30 years now, and I know you think that's not possible. He must have started when he was in his mother's cradle. Um, but is the, the way in which we tend to think about things very vertically. You know, whether you're in vaccines, whether you're in sterile mosquito technology, whether you're in, in research, we tend not to link things together very well. Um, and that's very limiting. Um, and I think you, were, you alluded to that very well in Leishmaniasis in Brazil. The need to um, look at the evidence base for the things we do to control disease and then put those tools together in ways that make the most sense. Um, who's, who's an entomologist, at least by interest? Okay, and who's a, a health person on the medical side-ish, technical medical side? One person, two people, three people. Okay, and so then you've got other people. Oh, I should be wearing this, shouldn't I? So, does that work better? Yeah. Okay, let me put this on. I've got too many mics. Um, hear me now? Okay. Uh, and who is a completely different end of, of being here? Who's just, who's an academic researcher without being in the, okay. All right, well, that covers most of you. Um, you know, disease control only works when you put it all together. Um, I used to run vertical programs. I used to have vertical thinking when I started. Uh, the Mentor Initiative works in emergencies all around the world. And it's always our starting point, is when things are completely thrown up and are, and are a mess. And that normally means that government systems are broken down. It often means that governance is broken down. It may mean that government is part of the problem, in fact, creating populations, displacement, um, and many other, many other issues. Uh, populations may be being targeted by their own government, as in Syria. Um, when you start with that, and we've been doing this now we're in our 16th year, um, which seems a long time. I used to be WHO Malaria and Emergencies in Geneva. Um, and we set up the Mentor Initiative to be a very practical way of helping other agencies on the ground think out of the box and make their responses specific to the needs on the ground. And we did so with a whole focus on malaria, which has grown and grown over the years to all vector-borne diseases. So we've been dragged into NTDs because there's obviously a natural overlap, um, as you'll see in a minute. Um, and there are also huge lessons that you can learn out of malaria control um, when you apply those into other NTDs that are vector-borne. Um, when we talk about disease, we often talk about the disease that we focus on. And we talk about it because that's what we've been trained to do. Um, I used to be the evangelist for malaria, apparently, and I, I'm, you know, that's what I've done a lot of, lot of time on. Um, but I can evangelize for any disease, as long as it's transmitted by something that's got wings, or at least four legs and will scurry along the floor. Thinking about what transmits um, disease from, from over there to you in the room is critical. It's not just entomological, it's not just what carries the disease physically, it's what you do as well to put yourself in the position of being susceptible to disease. It's also what happens in the environment you're living in, where the man-created changes to the environment, um, which you see dramatically in war, or whether the, it's natural changes to environment. It might be flooding and equally dramatic as war, it might be slow burning with climate change. It might be all sorts of things. Understanding those different factors is really important if you want to be able to do um, effective disease control though. It's being able to put those things together and analyze them. Um, so what is a vector-borne disease? Well, 
nice scientific definition there. Uh, something you don't want transmitted by an arthropod uh, or an other agent. And, you know, schistosomiasis came up this morning. We teach on schistosomiasis. We think that's an important uh, vector-borne disease as well, whether you call it intermediary host or not. Equally, rats transmit disease and are vectors. Um, they don't fly, um, thankfully. Because <laughs> that would be a hell of a bite. Can you imagine it? <laughs> but... but um, they transmit um, pathogenic diseases, if it's a vector. Um, they transmit it um, uh, through a vector, and they are only of interest to us in this room because they transmit it to human hosts. Of course, if this was a veterinary group, um, and it would be perfectly valid, they might be very interested in the same issue, but for cattle. Um, depending on whether the disease was Rift Valley fever or another disease that particularly affects cattle as well. Um, nearly half of the world's populations at risk of one vector-borne disease or another. Um, and they are grossly, disproportionately um, clustered, these diseases, into tropicalized countries. And all we mean by tropicalized countries is countries that have more vegetation and more humidity and more heat, generally. Uh, they're not exclusively, though. Um, diseases like leishmaniasis, um, as those who've worked with it will know, it often has very little correlation with the tropics at all, and sometimes the complete opposite. Um, but when you, when you want to look at disease, and that's what we're going to do in this workshop, is think about the vectors we're, that are out there and the diseases they transmit. Um, because it's very easy to make mistakes when you go into a place that's new to you and you're responsible for doing disease control. And that's how I'm going to speak today. That's how we're going to view things, is you arriving somewhere and having to look at what might be there in order to decide what you might have to do. It's sort of logical stepwise um, sense in there. You know, if you're looking at mosquitoes, we've talked about them this morning in the sessions, there are different types of mosquito, um, three majorly different types, Anopheles, Aedes, and uh, Culex. And Aedes and um, uh, Anopheles are of great concern particularly, but Culex also plays a role in disease transmission, as you can see. Also, so do flies. Um, Tetsi fly, um, limited in its geography, but transmits what used to be the second most important parasitic killer on Earth, sleeping sickness. Fortunately, it's, it's not now. It's under much more control. Sandflies, completely different. It's the most beautiful creature on Earth, I think, of all the vectors. It's a very, very pretty little beast. Transmits um, leishmaniasis and transmits it in many different countries. Um, and we'll look at that uh, in a bit more detail. Black flies, um, transmitting onchocerciasis, um, river blindness. Flies transmit trachoma. Domestic house flies that you would have in the kitchen at home and think they're an irritant, in the right setting, they'll happily help you go blind. So what appears to be a domestic creature with no real capacity to bite you and infect you can still be a vector, but doing it mechanically, picking up poo and putting it into your eyes, or putting poo into your food and transmitting with that all the nasty bugs that were resident in the poo to create diarrheal disease. Diarrheal disease, the most common diagnosis of people in any humanitarian emergency in the world. And much of that is contributed to by flies. Um, ticks, fleas, body lice, they're all vectors and they all transmit disease. Um, we often overlook these ector vectors, ector parasites, because they live on the outside of your body and we think of them as a nuisance or a slight embarrassment, particularly if you've had uh, body lice, um, but actually they transmit diseases that kill you if you're in the right setting. Uh, plague is transmitted by fleas. If anybody thinks plague is dead, I was in Madagascar um, just a year or so ago investigating 650 cases of, of plague, uh, a country which still digs up dead bodies every three years um, and in so doing digs up the disease and reignites uh, with a grave digger the clinical infections and starts a new bout of, of 
of disease again. Um, that's a very important human behavior that keeps the disease alive, not the, the microorganisms or the fleas. Rodents transmit hantavirus, they transmit Lassa virus, uh, Lassa fever. Um, bats, well, almost certainly have a role in Ebola and Marburg as the sentinel cases before those transmit into human infections and then start to multiply human to human contact and right the way down to things like uh, snails transmitting schistosomiasis. Schistosomiasis, the most prevalent parasitic disease in the world. No small thing. Uh, it might look almost unnoticeable, but incredibly abundant. So this is our sort of home environment for working. Um, and I suppose if any of you ever get bored with your comfortable life, um, going into the office or the lab, um, give us a call because we don't have a comfortable life. Um, it's fun though, and always exciting. But to work in these settings, you have to be able to stand back and be very objective in your thinking about what disease do I have and why is it of importance? Why is it suddenly upscaling? Because if you don't understand and ask those questions, you can't work out how to control the disease. And there'll be entomological factors in there and human factors and environmental, man-made natural. Um, natural, natural incidences like this, this is the tsunami. We were one of the first agencies on the ground in this event, uh, pretty dramatic. Um, the boat on the, the roof was taken by one of my team on the second day of being there. Just to show how nature can totally devastate and wreck, this is Banda Achi in northern Sumatra, the epicenter of the, of the tsunami. Totally changed vulnerability to disease, totally changed diseases, because it changed everything for vectors, it changed everything for people. Northeast Kenya, similarly, large scale flooding. If you're a resident in Northeast Kenya or in South Central Somalia, um, you'll be used periodically to flooding like this. It devastates communities. It does the total opposite for insects. It creates extraordinary opportunities for insects when it creates extraordinary problems for humans. Understanding those connections are very important. The conflict, the man-made um, disasters, generate a whole different issue. Um, if you're in Syria today, um, standing in Aleppo in the rubble, um, or in Iraq, or across the border in Mosul in Iraq, um, you'll see those sort of scenes and live in those sort of scenes where you've got constant destruction of buildings um, and major problems of breakdown of all services, no waste management, uh, no rubble clearance, but you're still living in those same residential areas you always were, but now you're living in rubble and crap, literally all around you, um, in unimaginable quantities for anybody who hasn't seen it. Or you might be in a situation like this in Sri Lanka, uh, in one of the early parts of its history in war, um, shoveled into a camp, or like this, not so um, organized in South Sudan today, um, in camps where people are living in squalor, uh, cramped together and exposed to extraordinarily high infection rates and death rates from malaria, um, and exposed to dengue outbreaks and other disease. Um, not to mention all the ectoparasitic diseases which you can imagine in this setting, fleas, lice, ticks, all the diseases that they carry are abundant. The more and more you live in a squalid setting like that. So being able to look at that and make some assessments on this is really important. If you look at the diseases that are the top killers in all of these settings, diarrhea comes out as number one. For those who are, are clinical and this is an, an MSF definition, Medicine Sans Frontier, and I have to keep reminding them there is no such disease as diarrhea. Um, that's a nonsense. Diarrhea is a symptom of diseases. It's what a whole multitude of different types of bacterial, viral, and even parasitic infections can cause you to do as a symptom. You can die of diarrhea, of course, from dehydration, but it's not a disease. It's a package of diseases that cause those symptoms. Um, but they are all banged together in diarrheal disease for most health surveillance systems. They're not segregated. Malaria, of course, is then the next biggest VBD killer. Uh, measles, not a VBD. Pneumonia, not a VBD. 
malnutrition is also um, on there as the fifth major killer in humanitarian emergencies. Is malnutrition a VBD? No. Does it have an important function though and relationship with vector-borne disease? Huge, huge, as we're going to discuss a bit more. Um, so vulnerability in emergency settings, uh, it's really important to understand what it is that makes somebody more vulnerable today than yesterday to a disease. Uh, I said I've been doing this for 30 years. When I started, um, I was young and uh, pushy. I was less well informed. <laughs> 30 years does a lot. But I was no less um, evangelistic, probably twice as much. And I can remember banging on the tables of the European Union, ECHO, their emergencies department, about malaria in a setting in Sierra Leone, uh, where the death rates from malaria in this setting were huge. It was in the middle of the war in the 90s. And the ECHO representative turned around to me in Freetown and said, yeah, but malaria was here before. And, I, and it was as if to say, yeah, but there is no issue. It's always been here. There was no cognitive understanding. And his, his opinion was not unusual in those days. He had no cognitive understanding of the influence of war, displacement, conflict, all of those things had on upscaling risk, both vulnerability to infection, likelihood of getting infection, and the whole environment of breeding the vector to transmit infection at much higher rates, ramping up disease. Um, and it refused to fund in that year. Fortunately, other donors didn't, um, and the British government came on and funded straight away. ECHO then came on secondary, once they saw we're not going to be outdone. Uh, but it was a whole process. I spent three days in Brussels, in with the European Union emergency officers, running a training for them specifically on this subject, helping them understand what endemic disease was and how it changed with setting. And it's the fundamental process of understanding you have to get if you want to make um, disease control work effectively and designing the right answers. So all of these things make people more exposed, more vulnerable. Um, so do these. Um, these events are pretty critical. We've got natural things that are happening in our life um, as a population around the world. Urbanization is huge. It's, um, we're all absolutely obsessed about cities and living in cities and creating cities. We see them as wealth, we see them as status, and people just keep building cities. Uh, you go to China, you'll see amazing cities. If you go to Angola, you'll see a city beside Luanda built by the Chinese, unoccupied, but huge. Um, cities and mega cities, uh, just growing and growing and growing in the last 20 years in a way that's ex extraordinary. Deforestation, reforestation, that changes the whole topography of land, it changes environments for breeding. Irrigation projects, um, military activities, they're not without consequence, not at all. They have direct influence on disease. Changes in vector control, what do we mean by that? Well, we used to have no malaria in, in uh, Tajikistan. And the reason we didn't, and we had very little malaria in Afghanistan, was because Russia used to control it when Russia was the global mass of the USSR. It reached right the way into Afghanistan. It had centralized programs for vector-borne disease control, for malaria control particularly, and it used to integrate large-scale pr programs en masse in Tajikistan and Afghanistan. When former Soviet Union broke down and became the Russia of today, all those centralized programs that it supported other countries that it dominated uh, broke down as well. And we've seen the re-emergence of diseases like malaria into Tajikistan and northern Afghanistan and areas where it had previously looked like it had been wiped away. So getting rid of centralized programs, you could show the same pattern for sleeping sickness, for trypanosomiasis, huge burdens of disease um, before colonial power took over in Central Africa and the countries around Angola and DRC and South Sudan. An incredible control exerted during colonial periods of centralized control programs, all lost and the reemergence of disease after the end of the colonial periods and the breakdown of those centralized control programs. 
very important areas. Um, extreme weather, well, you had some last night, didn't you? Thunderstorms and lightning, that was pretty extreme. Uh, it's nothing compared to the floods in northeast Kenya or the sort of flooding you can see in southern, southern Somalia and other places. Um, extreme weather is a big thing. It's sudden and it's relatively short-lived in the history of the country, but it has devastating consequences. And then you have these slow build um, changes as well. Uh, this is temperature um, being charted over, um, over the last um, century or more. And you see this constant increase in the average um, temperature around the world. And the last 10 years particularly being really, really hot. Uh, the hottest 10 years we've ever had on record. Does that make a difference to the sort of diseases we're dealing with? Yes, of course it does. Um, you, can, you can be as blind as Mr. Trump, um, or you can be a pragmatist and look at the data. Um, is climate change real? It certainly is real. What are the consequences of that in the immediacy when we look at the data? Well, it parallels very well with increasing burden of diseases. It's just one of the factors that can change things. Um, so who knows about malaria? Stick your hand up if you know a little bit about malaria. Actually, you all know something about malaria. What transmits malaria? Uh, tsetse fly? No? What's that? Lorries? Anopheles, yeah. Anopheles transmits. Yeah. I mean, you all know about this because you've had it rammed down your throat for the last 15 years by WHO. I started it. <laughs> well, I helped to start it. Um, we get it all the time on TV. We get it in everybody's campaigns, whether you're um, putting five pounds in for a net that only costs two pounds 40, whether you're um, having your arm twisted for something. Malaria, 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 malaria. We know loads about it. And so we should. It was the world's biggest parasitic killer. It probably still is. But we've made some success. We've had some success with reducing malaria in some countries. Unfortunately, it's the countries with the lowest burdens of disease. Um, those with the highest burdens of disease still have uh, unchanged death rates. So if you go into Central Africa, if you go into DRC, if you go into um, parts of Nigeria, if you go into Chad, if you go into South Central Somalia, if you go into um, bits of Kenya, if you, all the country places where it's difficult to operate, where you have the highest transmission burdens of disease, malaria has actually been unchanged. In fact, I could show you graphs. If you looked at the Guardian last year on Malaria Day, you'd have seen WHO's data represented by us in a slightly provatorial manner, showing the bits they don't talk about, which is the death rates of malaria increasing in all countries, including Burundi, um, all the central band countries steadily since 2009. Not decreasing, but increasing. All the benefits we've had of malaria control have been in peripheral countries uh, where governance has been good, logistics has been good, and we managed to make great gains. So there are real gains that have been made in Western East Africa, virtually nothing at all in Central Africa. Very different beast. And this still is the truth which is that children in high transmission areas die very, very quickly when they're infected, if they're very young, if their immune system hasn't yet developed. And the burden of disease is huge, huge. You've still got a huge portion of the world's population at risk of malaria. Um, lymphatic filariasis. Um, what transmits lymphatic filariasis? Come on, you entomologists. Or would be entomologists? Coolex could. Coolex could. Coolex could, yeah. And some Anopheles can, yeah, you're right. So in some places, you've got the same insect transmitting malaria and lymphatic filariasis. Very important point. If you're in West Africa, if you're in Liberia, it'll be the same Anopheles capable of transmitting malaria or lymphatic filariasis. We don't know so much about whether or not the same insect can literally transmit the two, but we certainly know that the population will. Um, and is it a, a disease of great importance? Well, of course, it's a huge, hugely important disease with a vast number of cases. Um, 
and a large, large population that's at risk. Anybody know how many people are at risk from lymphatic filariasis? Oh, come on. Be the other side of the workshop. Have a go. This gentleman's doing it all for you. 800 million. 800 million. I like it. I like a trier. Uh, I like a trier. Try more like 1.4 billion are at risk. So the, those who could get the disease, we think of this as a peripheral disease. But one of the reasons we do is because of health politics. We, we down-talk diseases because WHO hasn't given it focus. They focus on other things. Um, but it's not of inconsequence at all. Fortunately, because it's often transmitted by the same insect as transmitting malaria, there is a benefit where you've got malaria control going on. You will have lymphatic filariasis control as well, potentially but only if it's not Culex that's transmitting it. And this is the irritation of this disease, is that several types of insect transmit it. Culex, does it behave in the same way as an Anopheles mosquito? Totally so totally different means what? So where it breeds is different? Yeah, yeah breeding is different. From okay. From where Anopheles is from, the clean... And what about it's what about when it bites and how it bites and where it bites? Yes, it's, it's even even the, the biting the behavior, it's drinking actually. Even Anopheles is different, but it's in a compare Arabiensis and Gambia is actually different. Yeah. Yeah. Big right. differences. So where an insect breeds and where it chooses to bite and when it chooses to bite, massively, massively um, set your framework for being able to control it, to be able to intervene, don't they? Um, would you all like to tackle an insect that bites outside randomly during the daytime? <laughs> is that a nice easy target? It's not, is it? So why do we all like malaria? Well, we all like malaria because it's an easy win, theoretically. Sadly, it's not in reality, but in theory, it is because it's mostly transmitted, we say, by an insect that bites indoors and mostly when you're asleep. It likes you to be prostrate, unconscious, not able to swat it. The Culex will bite you in the evening when you're sitting outside, but Anopheles will bite you when you're in your bed, usually when you're asleep. Peak sleeping hours, usually. But not if you live in the Sahel and you're in the dry, semi-arid areas um, of Sahelian Africa, which is actually a third of the African population. We don't talk about it because it's not such a nice story. It's not so convenient. There, the predominant Anopheles vector actually bites outside as well as inside. And that totally changes the way in which you look at how to control disease. It will totally change the efficacy of your net if you can be bitten outside as well as inside. It'll totally change the efficacy of spraying if you're going to spray a room. So learning to choose your tools, right, for integrating tools against diseases means you have to understand a little bit about the disease. You have to understand the vector and you have to understand how people relate to the vector and anything that gets in the way or amplifies that relationship. It's very key. So uh, lymphatic filariasis, you're right, it's got three different um, types, even Aedes um, and Sona can transmit lymphatic filariasis. So uh, yes, if it's in an area where you've got Anopheles, it's a nice easy win, you don't need to do anything particular. Whatever you're doing from malaria control will have a benefit on lymphatic filariasis. That's already the simplest example of integrated vector management. Because you're vector managing two types of disease outputs through one vector. That's the simple definition doesn't work for Aedes, doesn't work for Culex. So it depends on where you are in the world. Um, and of course, this disease, unfortunately, does cover um, a lot of the world. So you will get a lot of variety, depending on where you are and where you're looking at it, as to what the vectors are of that disease. Um, Leishmaniasis. Really glad to have somebody on Leishmaniasis from an area of the world we don't work in. Um, because this is a disease that's definitely 
upscaling um, very significantly in parts of the world where you have war, which is the Middle East. Um, cutaneous leishmaniasis and almost certainly visceral leishmaniasis is upscaling in all the war countries in the Middle East and also in bits of uh, Africa like South Sudan where we operate. And again, it has direct relationships. And it's not an easy um, disease um, in many ways because we don't know so much about it. We haven't had it in focus. We haven't had the body of research that malaria has benefited from over the years. But it may be the number one disease in, a, in any of the Middle Eastern countries. It's just that malaria wasn't or isn't now. And so there's not so much focus on this. But we do know that there's a lot of different um, fly species. We know that 30 or so can carry it. Um, and I mean, just look at that picture. Isn't that beautiful? Just stop for a second and admire. Isn't that pretty? It is, isn't it? It's so much nicer than Anopheles or a Culex. Culex are dirty brown and boring. Aedes are right, they've got stripes. But that's so pretty. Do you know how big it is? Do you know how big a, a sandfly is? It's tiny. How big is it compared to a net? Uh, sorry, a mosquito. Yeah, about one third. So, um, do you know when it bites? Sorry? Do you know when it bites you? Does it bite you in the daytime or does it bite you at night? After sunset. Yeah, it actually bites at the same sort of time as mosquitoes do. And the reason for that is it's so light and so delicate, this thing dries up in the sun. So if it's in really hot climates and it's out in the sun, it'll die. So it chooses the logical thing, which is to wait until the sun has gone, your sunset onwards, and you're then starting to venture out looking for blood meals. So it actually falls into the same spectrum as malaria prevention because it's mostly biting people in their homes and mostly biting them at night, mostly. Um, and never before a sunset. Because if you ever see a, a sandfly with a pair of sunglasses on, you know that he's made a very bad decision if he's going out in the sun. Um, it comes in different forms, and the disease is uh, pretty horrendous in all the forms. Uh, it's significant in number. Visceral leishmaniasis is the one that people uh, will almost certainly die of if you don't get diagnosed and treated. It's also the hardest of the, of the leishmaniasis to diagnose. Um, it's much more complicated to diagnose clinically because it mimics and looks like other diseases. Uh, you might just think the person's skinny and malnourished. You might think they've got other infections. The chances of landing on a diagnosis for clinical leishmaniasis um, are slender compared to other diseases. You need to have confirmatory diagnosis. And not many people as health workers have access to that um, in the areas where visceral leishmaniasis predominates, like South Sudan, Syria, Iraq. Uh, Brazil may be different. I don't know what your access is like there. Visceral leishmaniasis diagnosis in Brazil? What's that like? Clinical. It's all clinical. So highly inaccurate. Yeah, um, and it's so inaccurate that in a place like Syria, we think it's a huge contributor to the other category in the um, disease surveillance system that runs by WHO and all the partners on the ground of the undefined causes of death because it's a silent killer, visceral leishmaniasis. It's nearly always not picked up. It's nearly always diagnosed as something else rather than its true disease, because it doesn't look like anything. Whereas if you're looking at cutaneous leishmaniasis, and with these sort of things, you see lesions forming on hands, face, any exposed part of the body, and they're very clear. They could be other things as well. They could be mistaken for leprosy and other skin diseases, certainly in their early stages. But as they develop, they become very classically clinically diagnosable. Um, they say that cutaneous leishmaniasis doesn't kill people, but 
if you're unfortunately blocked in a village in Syria, being barrel bombed by the regime and you don't have access to healthcare and there's no drugs and there's nobody getting into you because you've been isolated for six months and you had this disease, then you may become the child that we found with no face where everything from but his eye sockets had been completely and utterly eaten. There was nothing left. No cheeks, no nose, nothing. Right the way back to the ears. The stuff of horror movies, flesh-eating horror movies. Of course, that child will have died. Um, and it'll have died from all of the secondary infections that go with having all of your face eaten away. Um, we know there's a million cases or more. That's a complete guess. Um, a complete guess, because that's likely to be a much greater number now if we were to reassess across the world than when that data was put together a few years ago. Mucotaneous um, leishmaniasis is where it invades into your nasal cavity, your buccal cavity, your mucous membranes, and eats away your throat, your mouth inside, the back of your nose inside, um, and you get these horrendous, horrendous lesions. Um, the Minister of, of uh, uh, International Development in 2013, when we were lobbying for support in Syria, um, said to me, but Richard, this is an endemic disease that was there before. And I felt I was back where I started with echo uh, and malaria. And that's when I saved the picture of the child with no face who had been sent to me uh, by email 24 hours earlier. And I said, okay, let me show you how bad it gets for a disease that doesn't kill. And that converted him into a decision to give us funding for two and a half million pounds immediately. Um, and within a week we had the, the signed grant and off we went. War changes everything because it changes your access to healthcare. It changes your vulnerability to infection. Where does leishmaniasis uh, most affect people? Um, if you're in the Middle East, if you're outside of the Latin America setting, which is totally different culturally, if you're in the Middle East, what is the Middle East culture? You're in a Muslim culture. You're, you have a particular dress code. If you're a woman, if you're a child, you'll get lesions on your face and on your hands predominantly because nearly everything else is covered. And you might think that's great, it's protection, just wear more clothing. Uh, but what it means is, when you have infections which are eating away your cheeks, your ear, your nose, there's nothing left before you get treatment, your chances of ever getting married go down the tube. And that's true for boys too, um, as we've found in their very large numbers, because they're so scarred. Um, in that culture, they can't, well, they, they look hideous. They do. It's awful how bad it becomes. So a disease that doesn't normally kill still has massive ramifications for you socially um, and lifelong stigmatism. Um, and in a Muslim culture, that has um, even more ramifications than, than in some others. Disease, it's in a lot of the world, but not as widespread as some. It's more pocketed. You can see it in Latin America. You can see it in East Africa, particularly South Sudan, Ethiopia. Um, and then across into, um, into Asia as well. And then, of course, you get to something like this, dengue fever. Um, dengue fever. What transmits dengue fever? Hmm? Aedes. See, this, you're letting this man do all the work for you. So, what's your name? Wally. Wally. Thank you very much, Wally. You're obviously very smart. Um, so... Uh, is dengue fever a, a big issue or not a big issue? Yeah? But do you think it's a big issue? It's a growing issue. I like that. That's nice. Why is it a growing issue? Uh, but you're already making an intelligent comment, comment, so let's go with it. Yeah. From in Southeast Asia. Okay. Who else knows a little bit about dengue? You're, everybody's averting their eyes. trying, to look, But you can't help it. You're drawn. <laughs> dengue is today's fastest growing disease on earth. It is the pandemic that we live with. 
it is multiplying at a rate which is truly frightening. If you study disease epidemiology, it is a disease that's spreading into more countries than any other disease on earth. Why? Any idea why? AIDS, no? Go on. Climate change has a factor. Urbanization has a factor. Who said travel? Travel, transportation has a role to play in that. Moving people around that are infected and also moving ADs around. So which ADs transmits um, dengue fever? And? Go on. You can apply to work with us afterwards. Uh, no, go on. Uh, Alba Pictus. See, you said you didn't know anything about this disease. You know loads about it. The difference between Aedes and Alba Pictus is Aedes is the thing with tiger stripes that you see all over Asia and now actually all over Africa and all over the Americas. Alba Pictus, because Aedes likes to be, Egypti likes to be in the sun, likes the tropical conditions. Alba Pictus doesn't care. It likes the European conditions as well. So there's a whole um, Alba Pictus monitoring system for Europe. Um, I've lived 16 years in southern France. In southern France, we care about dengue because dengue is transmitted in southern France on an annual basis and on an increasing amount every year. Um, so if you think you're safe, and it's a disease over there, it's not. It's the fastest growing disease today of all diseases globally. It is the disease that will affect you um, for the rest of your lives in some respect or other, because what have we just had? How much heat have we had in this country for the last unbelievable, what is it, six weeks we've had sunshine, real heat. Well, that's what's happening. I showed you the heat chart. Um, that's why you get tiger mosquitoes, which are albopictus in this country um, and Egypti, and you've got them right poised to transmit disease. Are they infected and transmitting in the UK? No, probably not. What stops them from becoming infected? What? Climate change? No. What did you say, sir? Temperature. No. Yeah, disease. All you have to do as an effect is, sorry, what's your name? Zoe. So Zoe, assuming that you're riddled with dengue fever and you've just come back from your tropical holiday in France where you picked it up. Oh, that's quite a common trip, isn't it? France to Britain, southern French coast, round Marseille, lovely around the Camargue. Oh, I picked up some malaria too. Not allowed to say that in France. <laughs> <laughs> I come back now to my, my lovely garden in Surrey and the albopictus or the Egypti that's sitting in my garden now that's quite abundant and quite, quite active, but has never had a disease in its life, meets you, Zoe. And you become that sentinel case that causes now an outbreak of dengue fever in Surrey, across the back gardens of suburbia. Zoe, you have an awful lot to respond to. <laughs> You're a very irresponsible young woman. That's how Aedes moves disease from one place to another. It's exactly how it does it. In 1970, we had dengue hemorrhagic fever only in seven countries in the world. Today, we have it in well over 50 countries. That's the hemorrhagic fever form. We have dengue fever in over 100 countries. But from seven countries to over 50 countries, dengue hemorrhagic fever, that's the one that kills you. That looks like Ebola virus for anybody who's worked with hemorrhagic fevers. It's the one that makes you bleed from your mucous membranes. You don't want to date a guy who's bleeding from his mucous membranes. But you can meet some in London, potentially, in the next few years. All you have to have is dengue fever, 
multiplying and growing nicely in a community to get multiple different serotypes of dengue fever to start developing cases of hemorrhagic dengue fever, become multiply infected over time. And then you become susceptible to the deadly form of the disease. So it's a huge disease. Um, it is the fastest growing on earth. Um, it covers, this map's now out of date um, because it doesn't show the European um, transmission um, for dengue. Um, and you know, if you look at that map and you've got it in your mind, knowing that it's transmitted and is expanding incredibly fast because of the vector and because of human movement, when you look then at the next one, which is Zika, we can flick between the two, you'll see those maps are exactly the same. That's a predictive map of Zika. And it's predicted not on the basis of the virus being so extraordinarily capable, but of the vector that carries it being so extraordinarily capable at carrying disease. And it's all Zoe's fault. And you looked so nice. But now people across Surrey are going to be uh, devastated. So you can't take um, mosquitoes uh, in anything other than a serious manner because their capacity to harm you is extraordinary even when you live in relatively temperate settings like the UK. The only reason we haven't been riddled with dengue fever so far and we've got rid of basic malaria from our south coast about 100 years ago is because the temperature's rubbish, our climate's hopeless and because of agriculturalization, getting rid of breeding sites. Uh, that doesn't work with dengue. Dengue likes us because we like to build cities. We like to create artificial containers, old tin cans, jam jars, buckets in the garden, fish ponds, exactly the same as if you're living in Burma and you have all your water storage pots sitting out the back of the house. We just mimic that with all sorts of other items but they love breeding in containerized water, and so they're everywhere. Do mosquitoes breed in containerized water if they are transmitting malaria? Anopheles. Where do they like to breed? Anopheles mosquitoes transmitting malaria. Do they breed in the same site? No. no. They like clean water and they like surface water. Ideal rainwater formed into a track where you've just trodden in it and there's a footprint where a tire's gone through and there's a bit of a rut. Clean water or a whole flood, surface area covered in water. Um, that becomes the perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes that like open surface water and that's Anopheles very quickly. But live in an urban environment, particularly a slum, um, they'll be talking about Zika in the Americas and the slums in all the South American countries in Colombia and Panama, and how Zika is a major problem there because of the way in which we create the environment for the beast to thrive in. You may also be thinking about this, um, the trachoma, the most common communicable cause of blindness. Um, and just because a fly lands in poo, and then it lands on you sits in your eye sockets. And my children said, why do they go into your eye sockets, Daddy? I said, because they need a drink. Look at the flies in England on the horses. Where do you find them? You find them in their eyes. And it's because they're drinking the, the, the fluids that come out of your eye sockets um, and putting all the disease-causing organisms into your eyes. Um, is it widespread? Yes, it's hugely widespread. Are there many people affected? Yes. So, we talked about some of the key diseases very lightly to try and make you think about what are the issues that cause them to scale up? What are the things that you need to be taking into to mindset when you're thinking about doing integrated control of those diseases? There's a book here, um, which we're going to pass out to you. Um, I'm not sure how, whether we've got enough. If, 
Any of you work together? Can you put your hands up if you come from the same place and work in the same lab? I thought you four would be a, a group. We're going to ask you to share then. I'll give you, oh, you've got one there. Um, initially, and then we'll give you more if we've got more. Um, this booklet is something we were paid to put together, or we got the money to put together from um, US government, the emergencies department. We put it together in parallel with um, Steve Lindsay's group, for any who know Steve Lindsay, in Durham University. Um, and we did this in coordination with WHO, so that we had a huge piece of work funded by the Gates Foundation on integrated vector management overall for stable countries, which is what Steve Lindsay put together. And this, which is the how to do integrated vector control in the sort of settings we've been talking about, the emergency settings, because it's different. Um, there are particularities and peculiarities. Um, and so we agreed to do this effectively as a sort of annex to the whole package um, and put this out. So it's, it's designed to be purpose made for walking you through decision making for how to do integrated vector management in the places you are in for the diseases which you have identified are there. And it basically means if you've got multiple diseases that can be controlled by tweaking the package of tools and approaches you use, you can control multiple diseases rather than just one. It's taking away the mentality of buy a net to prevent malaria. Well, actually, is it just malaria you're preventing or are you preventing uh, also what? Lymphatic filariasis. Um, might you also be protecting people from uh, lice and mites if they're living in the sort of squalid shelters that they're in in South Sudan camps? Yes, of course you will. Nets will help. IRS, same thing. Thinking about the diseases which are prevalent because you have analyzed it and identified them for the area in which you're applying the tools. It may be one tool will protect against multiple diseases. Most likely today, it won't. Most likely today, you'll be faced with the issue that everybody is faced with, which is reduced efficacy of the tools we relied on because they need insecticide for most of the tools. And we're dealing with insecticide resistance problems now that are growing very rapidly. All nets that are commercially available have pyrethroid in them today. Two have an adjunct uh, chemical in there called PBO to help make the pyrethroid work better in settings where the mosquitoes have basically, or sand flies, have become used to pyrethroid and can survive it. That's our biggest challenge today in prevention, is coming up with new ways of presenting insects with insecticides they're not used to that will actually kill them. So because we don't have very many, um, no other commercially available nets yet that are based on a totally different class of insecticide. And there won't be for a couple of years, maybe for three or four, depending on WHO's very, 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 very slow um, regulatory process and testing process. It's always slow and painful. Because of that, you have to work with nets that are far less than, than optimum in their protective capacity in most places. And it means you have to look at the other tools you have available and imagine a toolbox from which you select the tools that will attack the insect that you have at different stages of its life cycle in the most efficient manner. So when you're looking at something like this, what you have to do is think about, well, hold on, is it just a net? Because what is that? That protects them when they're in their bed at night and it makes a barrier from infection so the mosquito that gets into the house won't get me. Okay. Or do I need to introduce indoor residual spraying onto a wall like in here where I can actually use a totally different type of insecticide, not a pyrethroid? I've got you know, three or four other classes of insecticide I can stick into a spray gun and use instead. Well, the person sleeping in the bed will still get infected because the mosquito doesn't land on the wall until he's, you know, she's taken her blood feed and infected the person. You kill a mosquito after they've transmitted disease. But in so doing, you protect your neighbor because that mosquito can't go on to bite anybody else in the village. So if you spray everybody's house, you ramp up the protection for everybody in the community. 
Um, do you fog? Is fogging where you walk around in the community? Um, it's a great PR exercise, very questionable for vector control. Um, and you kill all the insects that are flying at the time. Does it have a role? Well, I'm not a great lover of fogging at all because it only knocks down adult insects. It doesn't affect breeding ones. It doesn't affect ones that are not out in the daytime when you go out and, and fog. And what we said is for many insects that are transmitting in the evening or at night, the fogging um, may not time well. If you're doing it in the morning, it won't work because there won't be much out there that's an infective organism. Um, you see it rolled out for malaria control programs in national programs. You see it rolled out for leishmaniasis control programs. But nearly always when it's implemented, it's implemented at the wrong time of day to actually get the insect you're trying to target. But people still love it because everybody thinks you're doing something. Looks good. Um, could it have a role? Yes, it could. Um, maybe you're larviciding. Um, larviciding is going the other way around. It's trying to affect the water in which um, insects are breeding. And this will be primarily uh, an Aedes, Aedes insects transmitting dengue, Zika, yellow fever, to stop those larvae from developing into adults. So they use those breeding sites, but they won't be able to develop into adults. Uh, we use a lot of this, but we never use it on its own. Um, the guy from Oxitec, I was hoping he was going to be here today, he made a, a disparaging comment about vector control and what you could do in terms of efficacy, um, and he was not correct. Um, larviciding, with environmental control, physical manual cleaning of uh, water pots, can get almost 90% control of um, adult mosquitoes if you do it on a consistent basis and you do it en masse and you get the community doing it in their own households. The difficulty is getting people to sustain that. Um, we've done that. It's published um, in Yangon after Cyclone Nargis, 87% reduction in, um, in the insect population. Um, prevented an epidemic. Can you sustain it year on year? I suspect the guys doing Zika in Latin America are struggling. Um, they might get it done one year. Re the compliance may go down the next year. <coughs> but does it work? Yes. Um, could you be using... You know, are you going to choose a trap? Are you going to try and trap the insects, whatever it is? Are you going to try and destroy um, the rubbish that the insects are breeding in, particularly relevant for flies? Um, are you going to uh, put everybody under material that's insecticide treated, change their whole housing environment? This is insecticide treated plastic sheeting used in many different emergency countries we've worked in very effectively. Kills everything that lands on the outside, everything that lands on the inside. Still made of pyrethroid at the moment, so it has the same challenges as nets uh, increasingly have. You might even end up doing this dirty resort and try to deal with it at the poo end if you're trying to control flies. Um, flies only exist because of poo. Waste management as well, domestic waste, but primarily animal poo and human poo. Um, those are the biggest factors um, alongside waste management. So, uh, just to make you think a little bit, in a setting like this, um, it's where I'll shut up for a moment, just have a thought, and then tell me, um, what do you think might be relevant as, as diseases in this setting? <clears throat> have a guess, because you don't know, so you're guessing. All right, this is, this is the border between Chad and Darfur in Sudan. Uh, Least maniasis, visceral, yep, you could have. What else? Plague. Plague. Plague, you could have. Somebody else? What else is in Chad as a disease? Uh, uh, Rather abundantly. Hmm? Could be. But vector borne. Yeah, huge. So you've got three things you could have in this setting on the border, living in very remote. These are all displaced people. You've got three potential diseases. Ones that, or even more, but malaria, leishmaniasis, 
and ectoparasites transmitting a range of diseases. So what would you do? Um, somebody who hasn't spoken, tell me what you would do. What, what tools would you choose? Sir, I don't know your name, but... Um, well, oh, I do actually, you work for me. <laughs> Right. Right. So, really important point there. You've got two diseases that interact with people in a very similar mode, a very similar time of day. They breed completely differently from each other in terms of the vectors that transmit them, but they come to union in that shelter, don't they? In the evening, biting. Um, so, what might you choose as a tool? Come on, you really smart. You're all students. Yeah. Come on. You've got, you've got to have an idea here. A really good start. Absolutely top marks. Yeah. yeah. And if you can't get them, what might you use to insecticide treat your shelter? Spraying or bed nets. Spraying or bed nets. Um, what about that landscape? What else might you think about using there? Where are the vectors breeding? For malaria, for instance. Can you see the surface water everywhere? So there's not much around. So that means that the breeding sites must be fairly few. And that means they must be fairly easy to find and fairly contained. But heaving with Anopheles larvae. So what might you use? Larvicide. Um, yeah. So you can see when you look at this setting, whereas most people have gone in and just given people nets because that's what everybody did, actually you've got three diseases or three sets of diseases and they take and require, in order to work, more things than just a net. In fact, nets, the last thing on earth you put into these shelters, we did it and we did it to try out the whole thing and then we published on it. It's in American Journal of Tropical Medicine from 2015. 2015? Maybe it's earlier. Um, but you can look it up, Chad, Nets, um, and it's in American Journal of Tropical Medicine, and it'll have my name on it. We did a comparison of the best Nets that were out there um, in about 60,000 people's shelters, and we saw the mass destruction of Nets in this type of shelter from within weeks of distribution, not from misuse from people, simply because they wouldn't work in these shelters because they were being snagged and ripped apart by the wind blowing them onto the sticks. Main problem. A little bit of rat damage as well. So they're the wrong tool to use. The other tools were essential. Um, and using them in combination, essential if you wanted to actually get control of the tool, rather than just looking like you were busy. Um, so what about this one? This is Eastern Congo. Um, I think this was one of the shots I took myself. This was after the Rwanda genocide. Um, I worked through this for about a year and a, a quarter. Um, it was very challenging. What might you use there? Any ideas? Sorry? There's no toilets, there's poo everywhere. Poo everywhere. So people were dying here so fast you couldn't bury them quick enough. 50,000 people died in the first three weeks of these camps. Over a million people in four camps, 50,000 people dead in three weeks, all from diseases which would sit in that bracket of diarrhea, cholera, um, uh, and a whole range of others. Flies everywhere, poo everywhere. Um, what else? Scabies. Yep, scabies everywhere. Then the rains came, and then what did you have? Mosquitoes, and in this setting there were no containers. Forget that. It was nearly nothing. It was malaria. Um, so what would you do for these people who were um, self-sponsored campers? There was no nice French campsite for them when they arrived, no tap stands, no caravans, no tents. They were there, that's what they had. Makes you think, doesn't it? Um, the mantra of 
Annette? Hmm, don't think so. You have to look a bit deeper into your toolbox, don't you? You have to think, what could I apply that would give any form of protection? I'll go back to that smart student in there who said, tents. In this, they needed shelter. The thing that would have protected the most was insecticide-treated shelter. That would have been the absolute reason that was invented as a tool for this sort of setting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's what and it's what everybody did. And for the first seven weeks, that's all they did, and they couldn't understand why they could only get the death result, the death rates down to a certain level, and then they plateaued. And they plateaued because they didn't put sanitation in, and they didn't put sanitation in because this is volcanic rock and they couldn't bore the holes in. And so they really struggled to get enough places for people to poo. And so the flies were everywhere, the poo was everywhere, everybody was open defecating. And so you had this continuous level of transmission of diarrheal diseases caused by flies, even once you got the clean water in. So you saw a massive improvement with clean water, but it wasn't enough. About 20, 30% of all the deaths were still being caused by fly-borne diarrheal disease. So it becomes pretty important. Um, what about that one? They, they told me, and I had it on good, good authority from the American government and the British government, I was a real pain in their backsides at this time, um, and I had a BBC camera. Um, they told me these people were going to market. This was after the genocide. This was um, now when people were being bombed in the camps and supposedly all repatriating to Rwanda and Burundi, but about 400,000 didn't. They just packed up their bags and they marched into the jungle like this. What would you do for them? What way of integrating tools could protect people on the move? Go on, stick your hand up if you want to proffer an idea. What would you give them? If you can choose everything from the package, anything from the package, what would you go on? So repellents, I would have, I would have scoffed five years ago. I'd have scoffed two years ago. Um, now, actually, repellents are getting to the stage where they're so interesting that we would consider putting them into emergency programs, into this sort of setting, because repellents are becoming very interesting in terms of their capacity to keep going and the area in which they can repel from. So they could be something in your toolbox for this, yes. What else? Nets. So how long does a net last for normally if you sleep with the net outside in the sun and it's still up in the morning? What does the sun do to the net? Yeah, it does. It, the sun breaks down the insecticide content very quickly. And within about two weeks of misusing a net outside or leaving it up after you've slept outside, um, it will be useless it, in terms of the insecticide content. It'll also start to go brittle in the sun and, and rip more easily. So there is a type of net, which I haven't talked about, which has been specifically designed for outdoor sleepers. It's called a demuria net, and it's solid mesh. There is no holes in it. Um, and you can find that in a malaria journal. There's two papers on it in the last, again, 2015, 2014, uh, published from Kenya. Again, you'll have my name on them. And that's the first trial of outdoor sleeping nets for nomads. Um, and they work continuously they're designed to sleep outside in them they've got a sun repellent on them and a water repellent on them and they're they look more like a box tent um, lightweight carried by nomads put up at night four sticks um, and 22 months later they're still operating and still killing 100 percent of all the insects that touch them uh, when you do standard bioassays so there is a there is an option it's still pyrethroid though it hasn't got the new any new class of insecticide in it so it will only work in some settings. But yes, that would have been a very good option here. What else? Go back to the man over here. Your name is? Harrison. Harrison. Um, what would you use, give them? Not the tent material, because they're pretty big, so the tent's taking another round. 
Well, actually, they can lug these around. Those tents are sheets five by four meters, and they fold up into something about so big, and you can carry that with you. And in fact, that's what every person who's displaced normally gets distributed with when they first come in co contact with an emergency agency, but it's not treated. It's normally just standard plastic for shelter. So the treated shelters just translate that technology and give you the disease control with the automatic shelter, but they can carry that. It's a very good tool. And in fact, this is the setting which inspired the development of insecticide treated plastic sheeting right back in the, in the beginning. Um, and just to sort of tease you with this one as a sort of final one. Um, so this is in um, this is in South Central Somalia in um, 2006, when the whole of South Central Somalia in big swathes, the banks of the Juba River and the Shebeli burst, um, and large tracts of land were covered in water. Large tracts of land in neighboring parts of Northeast Kenya were as well. Massive population displacement, and very, 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 very large shallow vector breeding sites. When this sort of setting happens for the first month, you get no transmission of disease at all. And that's because there's so much water, it washes away all the previous breeding sites. But as the waters go down and they become shallower and shallower, once they become about six inches off the ground, Anopheles can repopulate very, very quickly in, in that sort of shallow flood water conditions. And of course, that nearly always leads to epidemics in this setting. Well, it does always lead to epidemics. So what would you do um, for that child and his family um, in that setting? By the way, these are down here. I think it was that one. What might you do? Larvicide? <laughs> See, some people would say, yeah, fly across with an aeroplane and and lava side. But that's the one thing you can't do is low flying aircraft in war zones <laughs> tend to get shot down pretty quickly. So you have to dip into your toolbox and you think, what can I use in this extraordinary setting? How can I protect that person and reduce contact? Well, what did you say? I would use repellents. What did you say? I would use insecticide treated plastic sheeting to make their structure with. Um, how about a net? Let's throw a net in there for good measure. If I could get them under it as well. Um, you'd use everything except larvicide. And in this setting, you would use everything you could deploy. And in so doing, you'd probably prevent outbreaks of dengue fever as well, when the floods really dried up and you just had small puddles and containers, um, which is what impacted uh, in South Central Somalia soon afterwards and then started to spread across East Africa. Thank you. So that's the last tool in your toolbox, but it's the one tool you have to pull out for every other tool you choose. So whether you choose nets, and larvicide, where they use nets and plastic sheeting, where they use plastic sheeting and larvicide, where they use um, fecal treatment to try and reduce trachoma and waste management and you're burning the waste and burying it. Whatever you are doing as your interventions, you must pull out of the toolbox your IEC, your information, education, communication, because unless you can get people to either accept the invasion of privacy that's required for going in and spraying the house, or accept and use the tool correctly that you're giving them, like a net, so that they don't sleep in it outside if it's a standard net, so that they don't leave it with holes in, so that they don't let it sun dry out, or you're going along and you're putting, what are you putting in water? Excuse me? What are you putting in my water? I've got enough problems as it is, and you seem to be putting chemicals in my water. Are you trying to kill me? Are you trying to make me sterile? All of those rumours are real, and all of those rumours happen when you try and larvicide water, the very thing on which people depend on for life. So 
your education tool is absolutely vital. There's one more side of education which is critical as well if you want these tools to work well in these settings. And it's called social mobilization. You need people to be part of the delivery, part of the planning, feel part of the delivery and be part of the delivery. If you want to reach into your house and you're in Somalia in this setting, your husband won't let me in if you're on your own. So I also need something else in my team. I need a balance of people. I need males and female because I'll only be able to get to help you if I've got a female person on my team who can bring those tools. If it's a sprayer, if it's a net supplier, if it's whatever the tool is, I need to be aware of the environment that lets it work and the recipient is the one that makes it work best. If they're on board, if they're part of it, if they're helping distri distribute it or deliver it, you'll get far more efficacy than if you come in with a foreign team and implant the, the tool or the strategy on top of them. All of our indoor residual spraying, anywhere in the world we operate, is done by the people in the community whose community we are spraying. They're taken from those communities, chosen with their, their community leaderships, they're trained by us, equipped by us, and then they deliver it under our supervision. Nets delivered almost identically. Same, same amount of community involvement. Lava siding, exactly the same. People from the community trusted, who will not be there to poison them, trained, equipped, and supervised by a core team outside. Um, and the education component, before, during, and long after, so that those tools you've put together in an integrated manner to really get to grips with this package of diseases you've identified um, goes on having its efficacy. So that when you go back to the, the community, you can share with them the results of reduced disease across the board. When you go back to the donor, you can account properly for the use of the money, having really achieved best bang for the buck. And I think that takes us to one o'clock, which I think is our end time. So anybody who's got questions, if you want to ask me over lunch, feel free. Um, I hope you've found it the lateral thinking exercise that disease control needs to be and not the vertical exercise, uh, which it can be. Um, thank you very much.